So we're going to talk about algae control this morning in stormwater management ponds, which if you live in a development and you have a stormwater pond, I imagine that you've come across algae issues in your ponds before. So today we'll talk about, we'll just revisit what a wet pond uh, standard design looks like, um, may look like what you have, may not. Uh, there's a bunch of different designs out there, but just kind of going over and show some points of reference uh, with, with your stormwater pond. Introduce you to algae, some of the species, the different types that are out there. Um, and we'll also talk about some plants that sometimes are mistaken from algae, especially if they're seen from far away. If you're passing by in a car or something, a, a green sheen on top of a pond doesn't necessarily mean it's algae. It could be some of these other plants. You know, why are algae blooms issues um, and what causes these algae blooms? And then we'll talk about some short and long-term controls of algae. And, and my main take home message is at the end of the day, nutrient management and reducing the amount of nutrient load in, in stormwater ponds is gonna help um, We'll call it prevent algae, but there's not really a preventative other than nutrient management. So a wet pond, it has a permanent pool. That's why there's algae issues. You're not gonna see those in, in most of your other uh, types of stormwater management areas because they just don't have a permanent pool and an algae needs that to grow. You know, the management of the permanent pool is difficult. Water quality issues, obviously over, over abundance of nutrients in there cause algae issues. There's also public safety issues, which is why you'll see bench shelves around the pond. So here's a standard design, and this is what you would hope for. Um, a lot of them, as you can see here, where my cursor is on the left, left screen here, is uh, most ponds have the inlets flowing into a four bay. And this is good because it helps collect all of the sediment that's running off with your normal stormwater runoff. Um, and that's how phosphorus, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, that's how its main way of getting into stormwater ponds uh, happens, is through that type of runoff. Um, if you don't have a four bay that's going directly into your pond and it's going to cause bigger issues over time, you'll have sedimentation and your pond bottom will, will uh, come up uh, over time. But again, I haven't actually personally been a part of any kind of dredging operations or anything of a stormwater pond and, and never seen it required. You know, maybe the conservation district has. But at the end of the day, four bays are supposed to prevent that from happening. And, you know, you want to keep those, those four bays clear. As Jess mentioned earlier in, in her presentation, you'll end up having outflows that end up outletting either to a ditch or some other system that eventually makes it into the bigger watershed and, and on out to where it, where it uh, outlets into the bigger uh, watersheds. So once you have uh, post-construction, which is where most of the homeowners associations and private contractors, um, their focus on wet ponds is, is to uh, maintain compliance and functionality for many reasons. Um, obviously, as, as you heard earlier, for, for storm preparedness, um, for aesthetics, um, for water quality, and, and there's also some opportunities to, to uh, enhance those stormwater ponds to, to make habitat for local wildlife or to help with pollinator protection. Obviously, do your preventative maintenance um, for stormwater control, I mean, for, for storm preparedness, things like that, keeping your structures unclogged. Um, and another reason why is because algae can, can clog up these structures, especially if it sticks to some of that organic debris and trash and everything else. And once you get a, a clogged outlet structure, it's, you know, it'll very quickly uh, decrease the amount of storage that you have in your stormwater pond. It can happen pretty quickly. So we'll go into algae. What are algae? So algae is the plural alga uh, and, a, and a single algae cell is called an alga, but uh, you know, they're unicellular, they're, they do not have roots. Um, Normally what they'll do is they begin on the bottom of the pond. They'll start to develop on the substrate. And after a while, they will uh, float to the surface, which that's why sometimes you might pond is perfectly clear. It looks great. And then you wake up the next morning and it's like, what in the world has happened? I have a, a huge algae bloom. And basically what has happened is, is that it's, it's spent its time developing in the bottom of the pond and then floats up together. Um, a little bit of algae is present in all aquatic ecosystems, and they're actually very important to the, to the health of, of the ponds, but that's if they don't get out of control because algae supplies um, habitat and food sources for macroinvertebrates, fish species, things like that, uh, amphibians and other, other herps that live, into, live in these ponds and these areas. And they also provide uh, dissolved oxygen to the water column along with other plant life in ponds. You know, one of the things, one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is, is dissolved oxygen in a water column. 
Um, but what happens is, is, and we'll talk about a little bit more later, is once um, if you have an overpopulation of algae, you'll get the dissolved oxygen deposited during the day. But then at night, as natural decomposition happens with, with algae, you'll end up getting a, the, the decomposition process uses up that dissolved oxygen, and that's where you get fish kills. All right, and mainly you, you won't see them a, a lot, especially getting out of control in, in streams or, or you know, water bodies that they're continually moving. Um, they like stagnant water, um, which is why you'll see some uh, water movers and aeration to help, help with this. So your green algae is, is one of the big ones where you will see a, a mat forming algae that happens on top of your pond. It's really unsightly, um, it can smell, it can also clog up your your um, your inlets and outlets, and and those are are the big issue with as far as aesthetics is concerned, and also functionality. You have your blue green algae, your cyanobacteria. Those are the ones you might hear in the news about being um, having some some toxins involved with them and causing issues. Um, we do have some here in Delaware that may cause some issues with your with your pets or your your livestock, but. Um, we don't have any of the major issues that that you'll see in other parts of the of the world where um, you know they're they're extremely harmful to human health. So green algae again they're they're filamentous, they're mat forming, and you know they're they're mostly green, but some of them can can appear to be black, uh, brown or or blackish green. Um, and again, they they're actually a very healthy part of a, a regular aquatic ecosystem. Um, but can, can quickly go out of control, especially with an overabundance of nutrients in the water column. And again, they grow on the bottom and then end up floating up to the top. And those are the gases that form underneath, and that's how they, they, uh, they get forward. So basically, if, if there's a lot of sunlight hitting the bottom of your stormwater pond and you have an overabundance of nutrients, you can expect to be dealing with algae. Um, you know, and, and a lot of these permanent pools are designed to be six foot or less. And you know you're going to get quite a bit of light hitting the bottom in there, especially if you have a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear system. A couple of the species that you might see is the Pythophora, which that's the horsehair algae you tend to see a little bit more in the mid to late summer. Um, it's one of those ones where you you might see this little patch of it sitting on top of the pond, but then when you go to if you go to pull it up, it just has this long stringy um, horsehair like uh, appearance to it, and it's it's very difficult to control when it gets established. Um, you know, you might need a few higher rates of any chemical controls that you do. And then if you're trying to physically remove it, it's just, it's a nightmare. You have Spirogyra. Um, they're bright green, slimy mats, um, but they are a little bit more easier to control whether you're physically removing them or trying to uh, control them chemically. And then there's Hydrodictyon. It's another mat forming spongy net-like algae that has a hexagonal or pentagonal pattern. Um, most of the time, if you're going to... Uh, to positively identify algaes, you're gonna to wanna to do it underneath a microscope. Um, but a lot of times you'll be able to tell if it's, if it's filamentous and, and that's really what, the, what separates it for what type of uh, control that you're gonna use. Another type of algae is, is Cara. It's another green filamentous algae, but it actually anchors itself to the substrate and will grow on the bottom um of ponds and it doesn't root but it's just got an anchor there and it's the same thing as algae except it just looks a little bit more like a plant um, it can form dense stands uh, especially with an overabundance of nutrients but again this is one of the the big um, healthy algaes that you'll find in ponds around here and if it's not growing out of control no need to there's, there's really no need to control it unless it gets out of control and and a good way to to tell the difference between the this algae and maybe some pond weeds is, is if you pull up a, a clump of it and you squeeze it, it pops. You'll feel like this little pop, this little air bubbles in there. And here's some here's some of the pictures of of what you can see. Um, obviously, in the top right here, that's what the cara looks like. That's where it kind of looks like a little bit of a, a pond weed. But again, once you pull it up, you'll see that it doesn't have roots, and also you'll be able to feel the little popping sensation. Here in the top left, this is the, you kind of see the, the net-like appearance of the, the Hydrodictyon. And then uh, the, two, the two at the bottom here, the, the one on the bottom right is the horsehair algae. You can kind of see how just dense it is and how like once you start to pull it up, it's like this never-ending string of algae. Um, and then also in the bottom left, uh, this is the, the other green algae that, that forms a mat that's pretty easy to scoop off the top. You won't have the long uh, strands underneath.
Then you go to the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria. It forms like a pond scum or a pea soup is what we used to call uh, the look of it. And it's pretty easy to see. If you look at a, at a pond, it just has this green appearance and it's not like a matte green. It's just, you know, the, the pond just looks pea, like a pea soup. That's when you can kind of tell that there's going to be some blue-green algae in there. And a lot of these um, are really detrimental just to the health of the pond because of the, the boom and the amount of algae that's there. You might see this big mat of algae and think, oh my goodness, there's a lot of algae there. But if it's, if it's you know, underneath of that, there's not as much. But then when you have the, the blue-green algae explosions in ponds, it's all throughout the water column. It's everywhere. Um, and this is really where you get the dissolved oxygen issues because those, the, the, amount, the sheer amount of uh, algae that dies per day in, in that system you know, just uses up a ton of the dissolved oxygen and that's it very quickly lowers that level to critical levels and then you'll have fish kills and generally what will happen is, is you'll experience in the morning that the fish were fine the day before and then at night they, they've lost the amount of oxygen they need and then they're and then they die. And some of these species also fix nitrogen so they can actually um, you know even if if an area may not have as much of the uh, nutrients flowing into the pond, they can actually fix, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and also continue to cause more problems. And then also some of these algaes will excrete toxins, um, um, you know, and they'll, they'll cause a few issues in livestock, people, your dogs, you don't want them swimming in there. And then some, some of them can be a little bit more dangerous and cause maybe some neurotox neurotoxicity or some kidney or liver problems. Some of the species that, that you'll find around, microcystis, that's the one where it's, it's more of that pea soup appearance. These actually do con contain a small hepatotoxin, microcystin, and that's where you'll get the incontinence or you'll get some, some possible um, kidney or liver issues, but they're not the ones that, that are gonna be fatal for the most part. Lingbia is, is, a, is actually a mat forming uh, blue-green algae where it, uh, they, they kind of create a little bit more groups and that look a little bit more like the, the, the green algae when they form mats, but they're, you can tell they're just a little bit different by when you pick them up and they're not as, it's not as, um, as together and, and grouped as you would find the, the green algae. These can cause a little bit of skin irritations, but they're, they're not gonna be having long-term issues either. And then Anabina, is one of the more dangerous ones. And they're, they're another one that kind of looks like it's a, a, a pea soup um, colonizing cyanobacteria. And these do have some neurotoxins and they also have the hepatotoxins in there as well. Um, you know, haven't really heard about those being a giant issue around here, but again, if, you're, if you have a pond and you're seeing the pea soup appearance, it might not hurt to, to contact NREC and try to get them to identify what type of algae you have. Here's what it'll look like. You can kind of see here in the top left that this, you got that pea soup type of, of look to it and the same thing here in the center. Um, you might have a little bit of aggregation along this, but this is generally what you're gonna see. Um, and then on the, on the right, you'll see that's that mat forming lingbia, that's a, a blue green. It's not, it's not quite as, as, um, as, you won't see the aggregates being quite the same as the green, green algae forming like solid mats, but it still obviously can, can be very unsightly and, and create issues in ponds. So we move on to plants that are mistaken for algae. You know, what type of plants that we can come across? And one of them is common duckweed. Um, it's, it's a small floating plant that actually, it actually does have some small roots on, on the fronds. It's one to three fronds uh, slash leaves per plant. Um, and it reproduces by seed and asexual budding. So that's another one of those that, you know, you can see it as a small amount one day and then by the end of the week, it could be really threatening to cover the pond. Again, it's another beneficial plant, especially the, the, if there's a native species of it. There is an Asian duckweed that is a little bit bigger that we definitely don't want around. Um, but in small amounts, you know, duckweed is not bad. You know, it's for good for waterfowl um, and other macroinvertebrates, fish, things like that, that, that use this as part of their, their, normal, their normal life cycle. Um, but again, you know, in, in slow moving, eutrophic waters, which nutrient rich waters, they become an issue very quickly. And, uh, you know, they'll cover the surface and, and treatment for those get a little bit, uh, a little bit more difficult, especially since you don't want to treat an entire pond that's covered uh, with these plants because they will definitely, the de decomposition will use up the um, dissolved oxygen quickly, killing most of what's in there. 
water meal is another one. This is, this is a more uh, grainy looking plant, you know, very quickly covers ponds. A lot of times you'll see um, maybe some irrigation ponds around farms. You can get, get this in it pretty heavily. And um, it's, it's a really, really hard one to control. Um, I never really had a lot of success with that when I was, when, when I worked in, in these systems. And, um, you know, there are ways to do it, but uh, it, it's a little bit more difficult. You definitely want to get these when they're in a small population. So here you go. This is a good picture showing both of them. The bigger plants that you can see will like the little fronds and leaves. That's the duckweed and and the smaller grainy ones is water meal. Again, they usually, usually you'll find them growing together, but if you go by a pond that's just bright green, almost a neon green, completely covered, most likely it's not algae in there. It's most likely going to be duckweed and, um, and water meal. Not to say that algae isn't underneath of it, but that's, that's really what this is, and it's a difficult plant to, to take care of. And here's another picture of, of just what a pond can look like. And this is just, I mean, it, they're just wall-to-wall -wall covered with these plants, and it's, it's going to be a, a, an issue trying to get that under control. You almost might want to just wait till next year if you don't have a harvester or something like that and get it when it's small, a small population a little earlier in the year. So why are we worried about algae blooms? Well, quite obviously, they're very unsightly, and sometimes they have unpleasant smells. So those are the number one uh, reasons that, that most homeowners associations and homeowners will, will have with, with algae issues. But then you also have that, that, that they can clog the outfall structures, creating less, uh, less storage space and, and higher potential for flooding if you have a, a big rain event. Um, reduced water source capacity, as I said, di reduced diversity in plant life and in what lives in the pond. A lot of times you could tell about the health of a, uh, an aquatic system based on the macroinvertebrates. So if you have a, healthily, uh, a heavily eutrophic uh, system where there's a lot of algae issues, most of the time you might not find any fish or, or herps um, using that at all. You'll, you might just find red worms and leeches and things like that living there. And it also reduces dissolved oxygen just because of the, the die off and uh, use of um, dissolved oxygen in that decomposition process overnight. You know, so where, what causes algae blooms? Well, for one, they do like the shallow stagnant water that doesn't move. And then they like the high nutrient load. You know, nitrogen and phosphorus are, are the limiting factors in, in, in algae blooms. If you have a presence, an overpresence of nitrogen and especially phosphorus, um, that's, that's where you're going to have your major issues with, with algae. And honestly, that's what these ponds are designed for, right? They're designed to be the last line of defense um, against stormwater runoff and stormwater management. So it's supposed to collect the sediment. It's supposed to collect the nutrients and the pollutants to stop them from getting in the system. But as we'll talk about later on, we can reduce that amount of stress on these, the, these systems by what we do around the house and what we do in our open spaces and things like that. And phosphorus, um, Again, it binds to the sediment very readily, um, and that's usually how it ends up in stormwater ponds, but it also can be deposited by, by geese, a little bit of fertilizer runoff, and then also uh, organic material runoff as well. Nitrogen is, is more um, mobile in the soil solution, so a big rain event, if you've just put some fertilizer down um, and it's nitrogen heavy, there's a good chance to lose nitrogen just because it doesn't bind to the soil as, as, as heavily. So I put this on there and there's a lot going on here. You do need, not need to remember this, but there's just a, just wanted to point out that there's a, a nitrogen cycle of how it moves around in, in the environment and kind of what, where the problems come in and why we end up seeing uh, eutrophication or, or high levels in, in our water. Some of it happens because of fertilizer runoff, but a lot of the farmers nowadays have the conservation uh, practices in place that helps reduce that amount. And you know, we have the nutrient management program that uh, creates plans for farmers and homeowners in order to properly fertilize. So this is becoming less and less of an issue over time just because of how we're managing it. Um, but then again, you know, other things like people dumping yard waste, like if you've walked along a, a, a like a tax ditch or, or some kind of private ditch and you see like there's just this loads of yard waste that people dump right there on the side of the ditch. It's like, that's a direct way for you to just dump nitrogen and phosphorus right into the water system and that's just not going to help things you know you need to you need to find alternate uh, uses of grass clippings or yard waste you know there's other things you can do and you know just trying not to let it get uh, straight in into those stormwater ponds and 
and conveyance systems. This guy right here is, you know, I, I've tried and tried to find like some studies that could give me really solid numbers on exactly, you know, what, what amount of phosphorus and nitrogen is being deposited in these ponds, but I couldn't really find any solid numbers, but I did find this. So according to National Geographic, 50 Canada geese, which 50 is not, a, it's, it's not hard to find that many in, in any of your developments around there. I'm sure anybody here can attest to that. But 50 Canada geese can produce <laughs> up to two and a half tons of excrement per year. I mean, just that's, that's amazing. It's crazy. I, I heard some, I found some studies also that said they, they um, defecate like every two minutes or something crazy like that, which if you have an open space with Canada geese around there, I'm sure you know exactly how much they deposit. Again, here's the phosphorus, cy phosphorus cycle. It moves around a little differently than nitrogen does. It has a different source of where it comes from. But the, the key here is, is that phosphorus binds tightly to the soil. When it becomes an issue is once the phosphorus buildup in the soil gets too much, the soil can't hold on to it, that's when it starts to move. Or also when, when sediment becomes unstable and when it, gets, when it runs off into the pond, phosphorus goes with it. Organic material, again, once it decays, releases the phosphorus into the water column, and that's where you have the issues. Another source of phosphorus is this guy again. Um, you know, I can't, I can't mention enough how, especially migratory Canada geese can really cause issues in, in ponds, and, and there's definitely ways to, to prevent them from, from making their presence felt. And one of those is a healthy vegetative buffer um, and riparian buffer. They don't like walking through that stuff. Um, they're, they know that predators live there. So even just having that will, will help a lot. All right, again, fertilization practices, they've changed over the years, the nutrient management program, the, the ways that folks are, are applying fertilizer um, has gotten better. And I'll be honest, it really seems like farmers have that under control, whereas the landscape and, and turf business is still a little bit, it, we, can, we can improve that. And we have been working on that with livable landscapes and things like that and training, uh, you know, landscapers and fertilizers in the turf industry. And that's also something you can, we can do on our own. Whereas if we're fertilizing our own yards, getting the soil test done, putting it down what we need, when we need it, um, is definitely the key to, to helping reduce the amount of phosphorus getting into the, and yard waste is another one. I, I you know, I said it before, but also I've seen uh, times when folks are cutting their grass near a system or, or a drainage system, even if it's, if, even if it's like your, um, like a small uh, conveyance system along the roadside or something like that and blowing the grass right in there. That's a direct way to, to put nutrients and phosphorus into the, into the water column. So just trying to find ways to reduce doing that and just being conscious when you're, when you're working around this pond. So once we get to that point, now, now what do we do? Now that we know that we have an algae problem, we've already gotten behind, behind the eight ball, we're behind the battle and now we just need to uh, take immediate action to control what's there. So what can we do? We can do physical removal, we can do chemical treatment or a combination of the two. Now physical removal is, is definitely the best way to, to take care of this. Okay, are there any other questions about uh, what we've gone over so far? That the vegetative buffers definitely helped with geese um, around our pond at home. That, you know, early in the season when the plants were short, we did have some geese in there, but since then I haven't had any. Right. Right. Um, and, that's been, and, and someone asked the width of the buffer and what plants are in it. I'm going to be honest, it's whatever grows up around the pond at my house. It's actually an old irrigation pond that we have on our property. And so, you know, I let whatever native plants are around in there. Um, I do have something like dog bane and some other um, brambles and all kinds of stuff because we love to have rabbits around the house. But yeah, any, any, you know, elevated plant material around that pond is really important. They just don't like walking through that. Right, exactly. And, and one of the things I always say is, is just treating the, the buffer kind of like a meadow. Um, you know, keeping the woody stems out of, of the durarium buffer. Um, and, you know, maybe you can get some of those as farther out from around the pond, but yeah, just kind of managing it as a meadow. Um, usually you'll get a good, uh, a good amount of, of native beneficial species there. But just having, you know, whoever manages that area scout for any invasive species or any problematic species is, is definitely something you want to do. You know, so again, so removing algae, physical removal, as I was going to say earlier, it's, it's the best way 
to help the pond in general, but it's gonna be the most difficult labor intensive way. Um, because once with the physical removal, you're actually removing nutrients at the same time. So if you chemically treat algae, it dies, it decays, and a lot of that nutrient's gonna get re released right back into the water column, and you're in this never ending cycle. So physical removal is the best, but obviously at, at times you can't do that. And uh, if you treat um, algae in a smaller, uh, when it's in a smaller aggregate and population, you know, it's, it's just a lot better to be able to keep up with that. But again, the, the immediate actions are to just take care of what's there now. And if you wanna be really successful, you have to go to long-term nutrient management. And that's gonna be community-wide and it starts with homeowners. Here's an example of physical removal. Um, you know, this, this is a lot, a lot of algae, um, and it was done by hand, and it's, it, it's still probably removed maybe a tenth of what was there. It was good because that's a lot of nutrients that you remove. It's a lot of algae, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be the, the end all. So you still had to do some, uh, some chemical treatments after that. So obviously, if you're gonna be using pesticides in and around ponds, whether it's algicides or you're treating plants um, in and around the ponds, you gotta make sure that you're using products that have been approved for use in um, aquatic systems. Um, a lot of research and, and testing has gone into these and a lot of the difference between um, most of the terrestrial, terrestrial products when compared to the aquatic products is the surfactants in them. And you know they just, are just different, um, more, less dangerous to aquatic life um, adjuvants. So the surfactants are, are not gonna be harmful to the macroinvertebrates and fish, and a lot of the chemicals aren't either. But one of the algicides, a major one that works really well is copper sulfate, or you have different iterations of it, whether it's chelated copper sulfate or you know, just other formulations where copper is the actual uh, thing that's killing, killing the algae comes in different forms. It can be a granular, uh, where a granular will be good if you're trying to treat um, some of those algaes that are either developing on the bottom of the pond or, or anchored on the bottom of the pond. They come in liquids. But the problem there is if you have a smaller pond or it's, it's, you have some, um, some fish such as koi or trout, it can be potentially toxic to them. And then it, but then it also has activity on some, pie, some pond weeds, especially hydrilla. Hydrilla is another one that can be hydrilla is another one that can be problems in stormwater ponds, um, and this has activity on it as well. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone there. Um, if you have koi and trout and you want to be a little safer, there's a sodium carbonate peroxyhydrate, and that's basically like like a, a almost like a hydrogen peroxide how it bubbles up. So it basically just gets into the to the algae and, and bursts them, and that's how it kills it. It's safe for for those um, koi ponds, goldfish, trout, things like that. Um, and another thing is, is that algae should be treated above 60 degrees. Um, will it work underneath that? Possibly, but at the end of the day, um, you're gonna have the most efficacy. And you know, obviously if we're using pesticides at all, we wanna make sure that we're using them when and where we should uh, so that we don't have to overuse it. So again, the long-term management, it's the nutrients. Those are the reasons why you have algae. Those are the reasons why you're gonna have a continual problem. So if you just continue using um, algicides to control it, you're, it's going to be in this vicious cycle where you're going to be doing it over and over and over again. And uh, if you don't um, handle the, uh, the nutrients, that's going to be the issue. So some of the things that you can do is if you already have a bunch of phosphorus in your, in your stormwater column, you can actually do a, I, there's basic tests out there that you can probably find at, at uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, some of the other stores where it's just, you can just do a basic test to figure out how much, like if you're, if you're getting a reading of phosphorus at all in your water column, that's too much. So that, you, you know at that point that you're gonna need to do some precipitation of that. There's a few, there's a few uh, products out there. I can't give you trade names, but I can give you some of the, the active ingredients that are listed there. And they actually bind up the phosphorus that's in the water column and, and drops it to the bottom of the pond and, and just adds it to the substrate. So it's not available to algae. Um, over time, can it break down again and become and become available again, it's possible, um, but it, it's definitely a good way to, to, um, to remove it from the water column and, and get ahead of the game on there. And then again, so the sediment, that's how it gets in. That's how the, it, it ends up uh, combining over time and, and, and building up. 
is the sediment and that's why the four bays are crucial. So if you're able to, if you have a four bay in your pond, getting them emptied on a regular basis is, is pretty big um, in order to, to help not only sedimentation, but also with uh, reducing the amount of phosphorus in your pond. Riparian buffers is a huge one. Um, you know, just capturing nitrogen as it's trying to flow and sheet flow into the pond, it's huge. Uh, the plants take that up there readily. Um, and also uh, preventing um, the sheet runoff from, from washing phosphorus filled sediment into the ponds and things like that. Bench shelf plantings is another one. You know, if you, the, the bench shelf is that safety shelf that's about six inches deep. Um, I don't remember exactly how wide they are, but usually it's enough so that, that if you step off the edge of the pond, you're not falling eight feet into the bottom of the pond. It's there for safety reasons, um, but you also should, should stabilize those with some plantings, and that can also help take up some of the phosphorus and nitrogen there as well. But if you do that, you want to also make sure that if you have a buildup of organic material, um, just trying to remove some of that, especially if it's a lot. Like if you have a bunch of trees around ponds, you know, the leaf buildup in there can be pretty heavy and, and you want to take care of that. Aeration is another one that helps with long-term management. And that really just kind of gets the, gets the water moving around and it's just less likely for algae to grow and, and stuff that's moving around. Um, and even if it's not necessarily an aerator, there's water movers out there as well. Um, but then you have your at-home things like rain gardens and rain barrels. So a little more on phosphorus precipitation. It's lanthanum and clay is, is a really good one where it, it permanently locks free reactive phosphorus from the water column. It costs a lot of money um, and it's kind of hard to apply, but um, you know, once it is, it, it's a really effective tool for, for knocking down the amount of phosphorus that's there. Um, but again, it's going to get the phosphorus that's, that's there at the time and then if some is, is going to be released from the bottom of the pond, if there's extra still left sitting on the bottom of the pond, it'll bind that up, bind that up. But if you're not, if you're not attacking where the phosphorus is coming from, again, this is going to be just a continual problem. So if you're going to, if you continually have sediment that's washing into the pond, if you continually have uh, homeowners uh, or, or whatever, um, you know, putting too much phosphorus on their, their lawns and it continues to wash in there, then, you, you know, this is just another thing where you're going to be in that vicious cycle of, of, of just continually putting this in there to, to solve that problem. Aluminum sulfate is another one. Um, binds phosphorus, same thing. Um, it also binds sediment. So that's another good one. So if you have a turbid pond and, you know, turbidity is simply um, solids floating in the pond and most of the time that's sediment that's suspended there. And a lot of times you'll find that in, you know, if you have excessive runoff or if you have, you know, a big storm event, that's when you'll see the cloudy appearance of your pond. This can help clarify that uh, while also binding the phosphorus there. Again, sediment removal, um, the four bays, best way to, to attack that. Um, so the four bays are very key, uh, key for that, you know, um, and again, if, if you don't have the four bay, you know, maybe asking whoever is managing your pond to, to pay attention to the, to the inlets. And if you're seeing sediment build up in front of your inlets, trying to remove that. Um, full pond dredges may be required. Again, I, I haven't had, um, haven't participated in any of those. Uh, maybe the, the uh, conservation, conservation district may have more um, information on that. And then stabilize your areas that are at risk of eroding. Because again, the phosphorus getting into the pond um, binded to sediment is a big way that that happens. Again, riparian buffers. Um, you know, we, we've heard, you know, a three, a three foot minimum buffer, but the more the better. Um, so obviously the, the more buffer that you have around the pond is going to be, is going to help with, with uh, you know, preventing nutrients from getting in there. And it also has other, many other benefits as well. Um, and especially, so the riparian buffer, you should be selecting for the native grasses, forbs, and maybe some shrubs. Um, you don't want trees really close to the edge of the pond because of risk of it falling over and destabilizing the bank. But as you move farther out in, into the system, then that, that would be a, uh, something good to add into that. Here's some bench shelf plantings we were talking about. You can see here that this whole bench shelf is pretty stabilized with, um, you know, Maybe a little bit too much with, with the, the same plant. This is pickerel weeds, a great plant to stabilize bench shelves. Maybe a little bit too much of the same thing, but still. It's creating habitat. It's a native species. I see pollinators on them all the time. They love it. And it's really good at stabilization and using up nutrients. The vegetated perimeter, as we were talking about earlier, you know, it helps with nutrient management, but also helps reduce uh, geese using the pond. 
Um, if you have a nice healthy buffer, especially if it's bigger, they're not walking through that. Um, you might have some resident yeast, so you're not going to be able to get rid of all of them. But, you know, it definitely helps uh, take care of that and also helps capture a lot of nutrients and runoff. Um, you can plant trees and shrubs as, as in the vegetative perimeter, which is, is past the embankment, which is past the regular riparian buffer. It, it, it generally is the area that's not on a slope around. So that's where you can start maybe planting some of your trees and, and shrubs. And, you know, obviously you want to look at your operation and ma management plan for your pond to make sure that's okay. Uh, but most of the time, the, the more that you're doing to stabilize and improve that area, the better. Um, some of the management issues though, when you start doing that is invasive species management, which you'll hear from the, uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Todd Davis after me uh, about managing invasive species. But and it's, and you're also going to find differing, uh, differing opinions on what it looks like. You know, I've had uh, times where, you know, you manage an open space and you think it just looks wonderful. It's natural looking it, and, you know, it has some wildflowers, but it also has a lot of good grasses and some shrubs and somebody come and tell you, this is ugly. This is unmanaged, this is terrible, and then you'll have other people who think they look great. So that just managing those um, opinions and expectations is, is really big. Um, and it's, it'll be a little bit time consuming. But the best thing you can do is a consistent uh, scouting regimen, uh, walking through the area, seeing what's there, finding invasive populations when they're small. That's the big thing. And then you can just keep ahead of the game. So the embankment is a pretty important one to stabilize because this is the area that you'll generally see starts to erode if you have disturbance in there or if it's not properly maintained. But that's where your plantings should only be herbaceous. You should only be um, letting grasses and forbs grow there. And there's a lot of opportunity with, with the types of things that grow there. Um, here is some goldenrod. And I put this picture here specifically because I visited this pond, I believe I was working with Todd at the time at the Department of Ag. But I was, I was called by a concerned homeowner saying that they had an abundance of, of uh, ragweed that was causing them issues with, with, their, with their health. And obviously that's something that's concerning. We wanted to check it out. But this is not ragweed. Ragweed is inconspicuous. It's not going to be this. this. This is a wonderful plant. And there's a lot of different species of goldenrod. And it's really good for late season uh, forage for, for pollinators. But again, I just wanted to make sure that folks know that this is not ragweed. This is, this is uh, goldenrod. Some more management issues, again, the same with the vegetative, vegetated buffer is that you'll have invasive species and some other weed species that might try to take advantage of that opportunity. So scouting and catching those when they're small is good. Um, yeah, the, the erosion potential is there if it's disturbed or if you keep it mowed, it, it's a little bit uh, more likely to erode. And then it's, it's a slope terrain too, so it's a little bit more dangerous to, to manage that area. So if you got a good uh, established uh, vegeta vegetative cover there, that's good. And then sometimes you'll find muskrats burrowing um, you know, through into the, the, the slope and then up um, to, to make an exit hole. They can be pretty prolific at times and just, again, scouting and making sure that they don't become a problem is, is big. So again, this is some of the invasive plant species that that uh, that I've seen around ponds. Um, you know, hydrilla, multiflora rose. You got your autumn olive, Bradford pear, porcelain berry, purple loose strife, and phragmites. And you'll hear about some of them in a little bit. Um, if you have issues with them, check out the Delaware Invasive Species Council. They can help you out. Um, and also, the Delaware Wetland Plant Field Guide has been released by Denrec, and it can help you identify potentially invasive species. Um, upland native plants that you can plant in your vegetative buffers or in your um, in your riparian buffers. Here's some websites that which they, this and uh, so we have some um, some literature that has been done over the years that, that give you a list of native plants that, that you can plant in these areas um, and then to find where to purchase these plants going to the DNLA website they have a listing of the native plant dealers throughout Delaware whether it's wholesale or resale. Wetland native plants that you'd be planting in the in the uh, the bench shelves and more aquatic areas again to identify which types are there around. Um, the wetland uh, plant field guide is a great option for that. Kind of shows you what is naturally occurring in Delaware, and uh, just give you some ideas on what you can plant. And again, going back to the native plant dealers, you should be able to find uh, some dealers that that carry some of these. And some of them specialize in aquatic plants, where others. Uh, focus more terrestrial. We talk about winter organic removal. Again, if you just have a lot of organic material that ends up in the pond, you know, maybe removing that helps reduce the amount of nutrients back in there. But if you have a static system, 
where the re where uh, like you don't have a bunch of additionally introduced organic material or or nutrients this shouldn't be as big of a thing but just avoid getting your yard waste in there avoid dumping anything close to it and and trying to reduce the amount of sediment that goes in there is is the biggest part so um blake while we're on that some people had questions about what do you do with the removed algae if you've got you know overabundance and when it's removed can you just leave it on the bank of the pond well, not leave it on the bank um but composting it is definitely a, a, a way to, to take care of it um obviously you'd want to find a place that's not it's not going to wash right back into the pond or, or cause any other issues but yeah definitely composting it is, is the way to do that so aeration, there's, there's, and I know I'm running a little short on time, but so I'll be quick. So you got diffused air and you got surface aeration. Diffused air is generally from the bottom of the pond moving up, and that's, that really helps move water and provides uh, a more efficient um, introduction of dissolved oxygen. Surface aeration looks better, not as efficient as putting dissolved oxygen into the water column, but it does move the water better. Um, and then water movers, like you put them in a finger of a pond or some, something like that to keep water moving. Moving water deters the growth of algae. Um, it's just the nature of how it works. Um, so keeping the water moving helps. Not going to solve it without other things involved, but that's that's the thing. So as I was talking about earlier, nutrient removal at home and reducing your environmental footprint at home is the biggest way to help reduce the amount of algae and nutrient load in your stormwater management systems and in the watershed as a whole. Rain gardens as a way. So if you know like if you can go outside in the storm and you can see where your runoff is going, you can watch it go right in, right down to the street. You can see most of the time it kind of takes a direct path, like right over your lawn, right down into the, into the street. So you can, you know, you can change where it goes. You can put it into a rain barrel. You can filter it out uh, in a rain garden, things like that. Just trying to figure out ways to reduce the, the environmental footprint in general. And another way to do that is, is changing uh, your turf. Like, all right, so maybe you don't need two acres of managed turf. Maybe you just need an acre and then you can take, turn the other acre into a uh, tree planting or a meadow or something like that. Any bit will help. Um, and then also like the simple things, like most of you probably already do this, directing gutters away from straight impervious surfaces, you know, run them over your lawn so at least you get a little bit of infiltration and, and sediment capture. Um, and it's even better if you can direct them into um, you know, something, a system that has a, a filter or rain gardens in there. And reduce the amount of pervious hardscapes. You know, there's, the, over here on the right, you can see there's, there's things that, that can be installed that are pervious that actually lets uh, some infiltration, you know, whether it's, it's um, pervious concrete or some other materials that you can put that are stabilizing the area and you can park on and things like that or walk on, but they allow water to go through. Here's an example of a rain garden here. They can look good. Um, you know, they might be a little bit management intensive, but you know, again, it's one of those things where if you keep up on it, it's not as hard. Rain barrels, I have them in my house. I use them all the time for watering, watering my potted plants and things like that. So, you know, they fill up pretty quick, even on a, a regular smaller storm. Here's some of the stormwater management resources. Again, just check these out a little bit later on. And, and also make sure that you, if, if you have, uh, you know, a big, system community-wide that you can't manage on your own. Make sure that you're reaching out to your private uh, consultants to help them take care of you. Um, permits are required uh, when you're applying uh, aquatic pesticides. You know, that's something more for your manager to, to, to take care of, but just being aware that that's, that's uh, something that you need, you can, you can read up on those. Also, if you're, if you're using anything uh, as far as a registered pesticide, you need to have be, be a certified pesticide applicator, unless you're doing your own private land. Um, but I would suggest getting it anyway, just to make sure that you have the knowledge of how to use the materials and know where to look on a, on a label when you're using it. So here's the, uh, the general um, certified applicators, what they have for working around these, these systems in open space and stormwater ponds. This is the type of thing that you'll see. And mosquito control is really just, you may have a few companies out here who specialize in that, but most of the time it's, it's not something that the regular managers do. And here's a before and after, after picture. You can see that this is a little bit different time of year, but this was probably like a month apart. But this, this pond was, you know, overtaken by algae and then with a little bit of treatment. Um, this is how it can look with, with putting the Band-Aid on. So this was just treating the algae and getting it under control. And this is what it can look like. So it's, it's doable, but in order to have this, on the left on a regular basis, you really just need to look at the nutrient management as a whole, 
and starting at your home and trying to get your neighbors to do the same thing. And so again, just looking at the big picture, you know, our human activity stresses these systems out. It's just how it is. It doesn't make us bad people. It doesn't make us uh, irresponsible. It just makes us have to look at what we're doing and how we can do it a little bit better to decrease our environmental footprint on, on the environment as a whole, but you know, more specifically into your community-wide drainage systems. You know, if each house adopts um, these techniques, then you know, just the stress on your system is gonna go way down. And I apologize about the, the interruptions from my dogs. I'm sure that you heard the whining in the background, but that's the nature of what we're doing these days. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to let me know. Um, one question has been, has anyone introduced swans to their pond to discourage uh, Canadian geese? I have not heard of that. And that's one of those things where if you're introducing any kind of, of animal or biological control, um, you would definitely want to go through, um, you know, I'm sure DENREC or even the Department of Agriculture for permit requirements and things like that. So no, I've not heard of that um, as happening. I think that those, the swans that you saw in those pictures were just, they were residents in there and they were just, they were staying, they were there to stay. And they're, they're pretty nasty individuals too. So you know how uh, can Canadian geese can be um, nasty when they're nesting. Um, these, they, swans are, they're pretty territorial as well. So they might look pretty, but they're, they're pretty evil. <laughs> For sure.